Welcome to this afternoon's session of the Oxford Neuroscience Day on Developmental Neurobiology. Our first speaker is Simon Butt, who has been a group leader in the Department of Physiology, Anatomy and Genetics since 2010 and previously worked at Imperial College and NYU. And he will tell us, or rather he will ask us, about whether our brains developed normally. Off you go, Simon. All right. Uh, thank you, Anna, for the introduction. And uh, thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, now, first thing I should say is I'm the chief spokesman for the lab. Um, and actually, I'm going to be mainly talking about the work of Liad Baruchin and Filippo Getzi. Um, you'll get another opportunity here from Filippo right at the end of this session. So um, he will be unmasked at that particular moment in time. Now, if we were actually meeting in person, I would look out into the audience and I would see that you're all different, assuming we don't have any uh, twins doing neuroscience at Oxford at the moment. Um, we're different genetically, but we've also had different life experiences. And really the crux of what my lab does is trying to understand how, despite our genetic differences, despite our different uh, environmental sort of impacts, um, we still get to a sense of normal. And I'm certainly not gonna discuss uh, what normal is. So the way I'm gonna do this talk, because um, I'm conscious I'm the first and I don't wanna overrun and, and ruin Anna's timekeeping, is I'm gonna give you three ideas and then I'm gonna give you the hypothesis and actually the results that I'm gonna present. Um, so given this is a, a Zoom call, if you want, you can just hang around for the first five minutes um, and then go get a cup of coffee to wash down your lunch. The first idea I want to get across is that GABAergic interneurons are absolutely essential to get information through your neocortex. Now, we've heard a lot of fantastic uh, science about pain, um, lots of numbers. Um, computational stuff, but really, let's face it, um, we take sensory input, we combine it with internally generated signals, and we do motor outputs. And that's really what the brain does. It either does glandular secretions or muscle contractions. Now, the area of the brain that I want to talk about um, is somatosensory neocortex. It's up here. And if we zoom in and look at the sort of circuit level, we can see that it's organized into a layered and columnar structure. And what I want you to think of is that these columns are actually like processing units. And information primarily comes into layer four. It will then go up to layers two, three, where it will be integrated with information from other cortical columns. Then it will be sent down to layers five and six, where it's then outputted to maybe other cortical areas or subcortical structures. Now, to get that information through, that information is mainly conveyed by pyramidal cells. We need these little GABAergic interneurons to come along and to synchronize uh, the activity of those pyramidal cells so we get summation. And this uh, diagram or this figure I've got here is from one of Peter Samoji's papers uh, back in 1995. And what you can see is pyramidal cells are just ticking along, firing nicely, and then they fire a single GABAergic interneuron, and you can see for a brief while those pyramidal cells are synchronized. And that will be the information flowing through the circuit. Now, it transpires there isn't just one type of GABAergic interneuron. In actual fact, we have a huge array of them. Um, diversity of GABAergic interneurons is, is a real problem. What I put up on the right here is a schematic from Massimo Scanziani's lab published in 2013, which, if you like, is the canonical interneuron circuit. And the one I want you to focus on is this light blue one called SST, the somatostatin cell. And these sort of balls at the end are portraying the connections to those cells. And what you can see is this particular interneuron is not only talking to the pyramidal cell, but it's talking to all the other subtypes as well. Okay, idea number two is that pyramidal projection neurons populate the cortex in an inside out manner. So we're gonna build those output layers first, then layer four, and then layer two, three, which is gonna integrate everything else. Um, and this figure here is taken from a review that we published at the front end of the year, um, which is some of Simon Hipmeyer's work where he's shown that these are clonal projection units, so they're sort of spitting out these cells to form those layers. 
going back to the interneurons, this is the third idea I want to get across, is that there are two sources for interneurons. The focus of my talk will be something called the medial ganglionic eminence or the MGE-derived interneurons. And there, this somatostatin population and also another one that expresses a calcium binding protein called parvalbumin. Now, I put that little vertical dashed line because actually they're born earlier in embryonic life than those coming from the caudal ganglionic eminence. So these somatostatin cells I want to focus on are early born. And if we look at this uh, immunohistochemistry from my lab, I'm just going to get rid of all that detail that we've got here and just leave the line between layer four and layer five. Um, NKX21 is a transcription factor that labels these somatostatin and parvalbumin cells. And I hope you'll agree with me that actually there's a lot more green cells in the deep layers. Remember the early born pyramidal cell layers than there are in more superficial ones. And there's a number of studies that have borne this out. The somatostatin cells are born early. They occupy the deep layers, the layers of pyramidal cells that are born uh, in the earliest time points. And therefore, they're well situated to act as a scaffold to sort of constrain the early information flow going through neocortex. So the hypothesis is that gabaragic interneurons are a physiological scaffold for the developing neocortex. We're going to put them in place to sort of constrain the information flow and make sure that that processing unit develops normally. So the good news is they are. Um, my group over a number of years, and I'm going to show you some of that data, has started to explore these circuits. We've mapped them using something called laser scanning photostimulation. And I'm going to show you that actually somatostatin interneuron circuits are really important in somatosensory cortex. The bad news, if you like, is that this is incredibly complex. In actual fact, every neuron contributes to this information flow, why wouldn't it? Not only that, but all of the interneurons are interacting to sculpt the pyramidal cell activity. So while I'm gonna show you that somatostatin cells are really important early on, we're also gonna see parvalbumin cells contribute and another population defined by vasoactive intestinal peptide. For those of you more clinically minded, these circuits are transient. Okay, so if we muck them up, actually what you're gonna see in terms of the pathophysiology in the adult is distinct from actually what's going on in, in the early brain. And I'll show you one example of that. There really isn't an ugly, um, but there is why it's even more complicated. And again, for those of you that are clinically minded, um, this maybe is gonna sort of start some cold sweats. Because what Filippo is going to show you at the end talk of this session is actually these transient circuits differ between primary sensory areas. As such, you can imagine that a genetic deficit that, say, takes out some sensory cortex won't impact on, say, prefrontal cortex, or parietal cortex, or visual cortex. And so it's going to get incredibly complex as we try to resolve um, these kind of disorders. Okay. Let's show you some data then. So I'm gonna start off with work by Paul Anastasiades that we published back in 2016. And what we have is a range of developmental time points, neonates, what we term passive sensory and active sensory windows. And we use laser scanning photostimulation to map GABAergic connections across the cortical column, across these three different stages. And the simple take home is most inhibitory input, and you can see this on this diagonal line here, is local. So that the layer source to the GABAergic input on the Y, if you like, and the layer location, the postsynaptic neuron on the X are the same. But there are two exceptions that maybe you've detected already. And they are, during the passive sensory, we see this connection from layer 5B onto 4, and then it appears to switch to layer 2, 3. Um, this is data from Andre Marquez Smith, which was uh, in a paper published much at the same time, um, but actually was later data. And this just shows you the timeline. So actually what we have here is individual cells aligned going th through development from about postnatal day four at the start here to postnatal day 21. 
And all I want you to take away from this is initially you see connections from layer 5b, they become a little fainter as we go into what's called the critical period of plasticity and they disappear. And this is where we are now. We have local circuits in layer four, local inhibition, but we've all been through this earlier stage. Now it transpires, we were able to target these cells using a particular genetic line, and we could test that they actually receive early sensory input and have this transient loop connection with layer four, which will ultimately be the mature circuit. So now on the left-hand side, I put up Scanziani's canonical interneuron circuit. And the reason for doing that is that you can see that the somatostatin cells are competing, if you like, with the path albumin interneurons for control of the pyramidal cell. This is the circuit that I've very quickly shown you, that this sort of loop between layer 5b and layer 4 that involves somatostatin interneurons. This is receiving thalamic input. But if we shift to the mature state, which we saw at the end of Andre's uh, data in the previous slide, we would end up with something like this. And the work of John Isaac in particular resolved this, what we call feed forward inhibition mediated by path albumin interneurons. And this is kicking in around about the first end of the first week um, in mouse development. Now, what you can see is that we're going to switch from this somatostatin cell to the path albumin one. Now, the work of Beatrice Rico, Oscar Marin, and many others um, have shown that this is controlled by molecular guidance cue, neuregulin 1, uh, B4 signaling. And this is a historical factor uh, for, uh, for schizophrenia, amongst many other psychiatric disorders. So we thought, well, what happens if we overexpress neuregulin 1? Will we bias ourselves towards this mature circuit at the expense of this transient scaffold? So we did the experiment. Um, we were very fortunate to have access in Oxford to a line which transiently or well, overexpresses neuregulin 1 type 1. Here's the wild type data. And you can see this 5B connection early. And then it's becoming fainter. And then we're getting to the mature state here at postnatal day 10 to 15. And you can see that it's locked in to layer 4. However, in the neuregulin 1 mutant, we never get that scaffold. Okay, so I've highlighted it here with the yellow dashed circle. And here is the um, sort of superimposed average maps taken from this earliest window. And you can see that in the wild type, we've got this very prominent 5B connection, this blue hump in the, in the plot over on the right hand side. But in the mutant, it's locked into layer four already. So it's like we've sped through development. So what are the consequences? Well, all of this work has been done in vitro um, and Andre uh, did some electrical stimulation and thalamus and recorded from layer four and saw if we're still getting sensory information through. And the simple take home is in the wild type, we see thalamic input, but in the neuregulin one, and I have to tell you all of this data was performed blind to the genotype of the animal, we get completely flat line. In actual fact, it's a big zero. What you will notice is as development goes on and this is a juvenile mouse, we're starting to see a recovery. So what this has not addressed is are these somatostatin interneurons critical mediators of early sensory activity? And this is where Liad and uh, Filippo come into the story. So what we've been doing these days is we've actually been using an approach called optotagging where we express channel rhodopsin in our interneuron of interest, in this particular case, somatostatin cells. We then record spontaneous activity, whisker evoked activity, put that all together, and then post hoc stimulate them with the light, capture those spikes, and then go back and see if somatostatin cells are recruited. And I've just got two plots down here, raster plots of somatostatin cells one in the passive sensory window and one in the active. And what you can see is even in the passive sensory, we're getting robust recruitment of the somatostatin cells. There is a shift in latency as the uh, circuit becomes more mature. And you can see there's a lot more sort of spontaneous background activity as well. The summary data of this, 
um, if we look at the sort of percentage of responsive optotaxomatostatin cells, and um, we actually have two passive windows um, and just one active here. So this is really early, this is sort of intermediate, and then this is you know, the juvenile mouse. And we can see that we have a proportion of responsive somatostatin cells early. So it looks like they might contribute. If we look where those contributing cells are, bingo. We can see that during this passive phase, we're recruiting somatostatin cells in the deep layer. You'll see there's a huge transition as we go to active, because now we're getting a lot more cells located in layer four, that sort of thalamic recipient layer. And we're even getting recruitment of somatostatin cells that are in this layer for sort of integration of information. That's sort of active recruitment. What about spontaneous activity? Well, this is really interesting. Essentially, if we silence those somatostatin cells using uh, deletion of action potential dependent neurotransmitter release, we see that early on in the passive phase, we massively decrease the firing rate of the cortex. One of the reasons is because of course we're delaying thalamic input coming in. We don't have that scaffold to get the sensory information and the thalamus is the primary source of early activity in the cortex. However, if we switch late, we see the opposite because now we can't control the information flow in the pyramidal cells. And so it's going ballistic. We're seeing a lot of spike activity across the depth of cortex. One other thing that Leah did was we also looked at short-term plasticity and we focus primarily in layer four because we get robust sensory responses in the animals. So what we're doing here is we do a paired stimulation um, and we then look at whether or not that's facilitating or depressing. And so the main message I wanna get across here is you can see that it does facilitate specifically in this early window, actually during what we call the critical period for plasticity in layer four at a particular frequency. So it's 0.5 ISI, which is a two hertz stimulation. And others, Rustem Kazipov, Heiko Luhmann's lab, have shown that this is a sort of critical speed for early stimulation, if you like. If we silence the somatostatin cells, however, we abolish that plasticity. There's none at all. And it's not just because we're messing about with inhibition, because if we silence VIP cells, which I haven't really talked about today, um, we still see that facilitation. So the good, we've got somatostatin interneuron circuits. If you have a normal brain, these interneurons perform their function. They form transient circuits that are wired up, let the sensory information into your brain at the right time so that you can sort of adapt to your environment. If we're gonna start looking into the etiology of neurodevelopmental psychiatric disorders, we've gotta be aware that we might see deficits, for example, in parvalbumin interneurons later on, but actually it was the somatostatin cells early that are the culprits. And as I say, um, please tune in to Filippo's talk, which is at the end of this session, um, because he will show you that this is not the case in visual cortex, it's a completely different circuit. And that, this slide is really his introduction, which is to say, well, that makes perfect sense because we've got different timelines. We maybe need touch before we have vision in the mouse because you can see that the eyes are opening uh, around postnatal day 12 as we hit uh, juvenile ages. So last thing to say is to, to thank everybody in the lab. It's mainly been the work of uh, four people, Liad and Filippo, uh, Andre and Paul, but everybody else is contributing. And of course, my funders, um, and I have some absolutely amazing collaborators here in Oxford. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. That was very exciting to hear you, your tour de force through interneuron brain development. And you've already got a couple of questions up. So the first one is whether you think that the architecture of neocortex during development reflects the organization of cortex in evolutionarily earlier animals. Oh, great question. Um, I I would love to, I'd love to see you know I'd love to address that. Um, you know I wonder whether we know that the, these interneurons exist uh, in 
for want of a better word, more primitive uh, forebrains, um, I would imagine they play a very similar role because you know, ultimately what you need in a brain is to get the information through so you can perform the right behavior. And you're gonna have to have inhibitory cells and you know, if, if you look at birds, for example, they have somatostatin interneurons, they have parvalbumin interneurons, so they're there. And we know they're quite conserved across species. So my bet is that they'll perform the same function, whether or not it's exactly the same circuit, I don't know. Okay, sounds good. You have another question on whether the somatostatin interneurons lose expression of the adhesion molecules that regulate contacts when you have the neuroculin overexpression, or is expression of those guidance molecules and the adhesion molecules unaltered? This one, I admit, is probably the molecular biologist's question. Sure. Uh, we haven't tested that, and it, it, it's a great question. Um, Beatrice Rico over at King's College London, um, she done, has been doing some amazing work. Um, on these very questions um, and she would be ideally placed to answer that. Unfortunately, I'm just an electrophysiologist, so I stick my, my electrode in, record the activity. Um, I would imagine they are altered. Whether or not they're still there, I honestly don't know and I can't answer. Fair enough. And with this, possibly more questions will be coming in, um, but I will kick you off for the time being in the interest of timekeeping and ask Salome to start screen sharing. Salome Asaridu is a lecturer in the Department of Experimental Psychology. And apart from studying in Greece and the US, she obtained her PhD from the Mark Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics and the Donders Institute for Brain Cognition and Behavior in the Netherlands. Um, I'm quite sure that throughout these many countries, she has acquired phenomenal language skills. And she's now going to tell us about the language development and brain reorganization in a child born without the left hemisphere. Off you go. Thank you, Anna. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, get the opportunity to present my work today. So today I'm going to talk to you about a unique case. I will call her C1. And C1 is a 14 year old female, or at least she was when this uh, MRI picture of her brain was acquired. She was born at full term without any complications during uh, pregnancy. She has no history of seizures, which is really important. Uh, as we know, seizures have deleterious effects in development. Uh, she was first referred to physical therapy at seven months. And that's when her parents noticed that she uh, is not moving the right side of her body in an appropriate way. She had an MRI at 10 months and uh, that revealed a left internal carotid artery infarct that basically affected the entire telencephalon and the encephalon in the, on the left side. A neurological examination at 10 months uh, showed that she has right hand paresis, right leg paresis, right hemineglect, and right hemianopsia. C1's lesion is characteristic of a condition called hemihydron encephaly. It's a neurological condition characterized by the absence of an entire cerebral hemisphere due to a presumed occlusion of a single carotid artery very early in gestation. Some people hypothesize that it happens in the first month of gestation because the deencephalon is absent. It is extremely rare, so only nine cases have been reported to date, uh, 10 including C1. And what is interesting about all these cases is that whereas they present with contralesional motor dysfunction, their cognitive and language functions are often spared. So what is unique about C1 uh, compared to the previous cases that have been reported is that we have data from her uh, cognitive development from 14 months of age until her teenage years. So this gives us a unique window into functional plasticity and how it unfolds over time in an individual that is missing their entire left hemisphere. So C1 was enrolled in a longitudinal language development project that was run at the University of Chicago. This project followed 60 typically developing children and 40 children with perinatal stroke. One of uh, these is C1. The children came from diverse SCS, ethnic and racial background, all raised monolingual in English, 
And the goal was to examine the extent and limits of uh, the language learning process longitudinally. Um, here I show you some pictures of a participant at 14 months, then kindergarten ages, primary school, and in her teenage years. The project received three rounds of funding, so it has three phases and it spans the first year of life until the teenage years. And specifically for C1, we have very early data from her naturalistic interactions uh, with her uh, caregiver. Uh, we have uh, behavioral measures, so her standardized uh, scores in several behavioral tests from year one to um, year 15. And we also have one time point of neuroimaging data at age 14, which I'm going to discuss today. So the aims of the study were first of all, to look at um, Simon's behavior. So look at her functional plasticity and describe her language development across time from 14 months to 14 years of age. And because we had a wide range of different tasks, we could also look at the strengths and weaknesses um, and her performance across different cognitive domains. We also have functional MRI data, which allowed us to answer the question, how is language processing accommodated in C1 solitary right hemisphere? And lastly, we had the fusion MRI data, which allowed us to look at neural plasticity, uh, look at structural connectivity, identify and characterize major dorsal and ventral white matter tracts that are associated with language processing and see how they have been reorganized in C1 to support her um, trajectory. Today, I'll focus mostly on aim one and three. We situated our case within a group of typically developing children for whom we have behavioral and MRI data, but we also compared her to her sibling. So we were fortunate enough that her younger sibling, I will call him S1, also took part in the longitudinal study. So we have behavioral and MRI data for him. And what this comparison allowed us to do is to look at environmental and genetic factors that are shared between the siblings and that might have influenced um, C1's performance. And lastly, we compared C1's performance to three children with large left perinatal lesions. I will call them L1, L2 and L3. These children suffered a middle cerebral artery infarct, and we know that these kind of infarcts happen in the last trimester of gestation, usually uh, towards the end of the last trimester of gestation. So the timing here is very different of the lesion in these children and the lesion in C1 that happens very early on um, in neural development. Um, and what this allowed us to do is to answer the question of, is any child with a very large left lesion going to show um, the trajectory that C1 uh, shows, or is lesion timing important uh, in this case? We have behavioral data from these kids, and we have MRI data for one of the, the children with large left lesions, L1. Uh, you can see her scan in the uh, bottom panel, and she has a very large left lesion that affects all the lobes in that hemisphere, but it is nowhere as extensive as the lesion we see in C1. So we'll first discuss functional plasticity uh, and how C1's language um, developed across time and across tasks. I will first give you a short summary of the findings, and then I will show you, give you a flavor by showing you some graphs that um, support these uh, conclusions. So uh, when we look at performance across time, we see that C1 performed poorly during preschool. So especially in vocabulary, she started very low, but um, she caught up quickly and her language skills improved across the board during the school years. She outperformed um, the children with large left lesions, especially in the school years, whereas her sibling performed consistently above average. Uh, he was an exceptional participant. When we look at performance across tasks, um, as I mentioned, we had standardized tests on, uh, that span different cognitive domains. We see that C1 has certain strengths. So she's very good at speech repetition, uh, repeating digits, words and sentences, uh, she's good in phonology, which is the ability to manipulate speech sounds and word reading, so reading single words and non-words. 
And these kind of skills require mapping sound to articulation. So mapping what you hear to articulatory movements uh, when you speak. When it comes to weaknesses, we see that um, C1 is not as good in early vocabulary, in syntax, and in reading comprehension. And these are tasks that require mapping sound to meaning, and that is one of the weaknesses. We don't see any uh, evidence of crowding effects. So the fact that you develop language at such a high level did not come at the cost of other functions, such as number or spatial abilities. Because when we look at data from this kind of um, tasks, she's performing in the high average range. And as I mentioned, I'll uh, show you some graphs that illustrate these points. And I will start with um, vocabulary. In all these graphs, uh, on the x-axis, I'm plotting age. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting the raw or standard score for the specific test. The box plots here are representing the mean and the distribution for the typically developing children in our cohort. The green dot is the uh, case C1, the red dot is her sibling S1, and the blue dots are the children with uh, large left lesions. And what we see here is that at different time points, uh, starting very early um, in these two different vocabulary tasks, uh, which test how many words the child recognizes and can produce, uh, she starts very, very low, and then uh, at about 13 months, um, she starts improving. And we see that uh, at school ages, 8 and 12 years, she's uh, in the low average for the typically developing group, um, but also in the average range for the normative sample, so that is the population of children that was used to standardize these tests. Uh, when we look at a different skill phonology, um, this is the, the ability to manipulate speech sounds and it's uh, important for reading and other uh, speech functions. Um, we see that she's performing in the very superior range. In fact, she's significantly better than the average typically developing child in our group uh, at three of the four time points. The sibling is performing really well. Um, and the children with large lesions are performing sort of in the average to low average range. Uh, looking at decoding, this is the ability to read single words. Again, we see this very superior performance um, in C1. She's significantly better than the average typically developing child in some of those time points. Um, her sibling is also performing really well whereas the children with large left lesions are performing in the average to low average range. When we look at a different skill, reading comprehension, and this requires reading more than one word, uh, reading passages, we, she, we see that she performs in the low range, um, whereas her sibling is performing again really well, and the children with large left lesions are sort of similar to her, if not worse. And as I mentioned, we don't see uh, crowding effects. So um, the, the fact that she's good in language did not come at the cost of other skills. And to illustrate this point, I'm showing you some data from her math skills. So uh, calculation skills and math word problems. And as you can see, she's performing in the high range um, for the, um, the group. Um, the children with large lesions, on the other hand, perform in the low to um, uh, average range. So this kind of summarizes um, her functional plasticity. And now we'll move on to discuss neuroplasticity and look at white matter uh, connectivity. Um, so look at white matter pathways for language in C1's right hemisphere that might have contributed to this functional plasticity. We focused on uh, specific white matter pathways that have been implicated in language. So these are dorsal and ventral uh, pathways, uh, uh, white matter connections uh, that have been hypothesized in the literature to be uh, really important for language. The dorsal pathways we identified are the arcuate fasciculus that runs from the posterior superior temporal lobe to the frontal cortex dorsally, and the anterior arcuate fasciculus or SLF3 again running dorsally from the inferior parietal lobule to the premotor cortex. The ventral tracts we've identified uh, run ventrally from the occipital um, cortex 
So the inferior front occipital fasciculus and the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. Um, connecting that to the inferior frontal cortex, the anterior temporal lobe, and the ansonet fasciculus that connects the anterior temporal lobe to the um, orbitofrontal cortex. So dorsal language tracts um, have been hypothesized to be important for uh, the ability to map sound to articulation, so speech repetition, etc. These tracts tend to be uh, left lateralized, and we use deterministic tractography to identify the uh, arcate fasciculus and the anterior arcate fasciculus in our case in the child with large F lesion, the sibling, and the typically developing children. We also looked at the ventral language tracts. Uh, these have been hypothesized to be facilitating the ability to map sound to meaning, so being involved more in vocabulary, for example. And they tend to be bilaterally organized. And we identified the uh, inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, the uh, inferior longitudinal fasciculus, and the ancient fasciculus in our cases and in our control group. And what we did was we performed Bayesian statistics to see whether the cases differed significantly in their um, white matter volume uh, to the TD, uh, TD control group. And what we found was that in the dorsal um, uh, tracts, uh, volume is plotted on the y-axis as a percentage of uh, volume um, in, um, over the, the total um, white matter volume of that hemisphere is that C1's right arcate fasciculus um, is significantly larger than the left or the right arcate fasciculus in the typically developing group. L1 also has a really large uh, right arcate fasciculus, again, significantly larger than either um, hemisphere in the typically developing group. And the sibling here, the red dot, is, has significantly larger right arcate fasciculus compared to the control group. When we look at the anterior arcate fasciculus, um, so this tract, we see that um, C1's right anterior arcate fasciculus is significantly larger than the left anterior arcate fasciculus in the typically developing group. Uh, with respect to the ventral tract volume results, uh, the only significant finding uh, is that C1's right uh, ansonid fasciculus is significantly larger than the left ansonid fasciculus in the typically developing group. So to summarize the tractography results, C1 has significantly larger dorsal white matter tracts. They are in fact so large that it's uh, obvious with naked eye that they're um, significantly larger than the typically developing group. Um, and this might be potentially underlying her exceptional performance in these uh, tasks that require mapping sound articulation. So we see that a tract that is usually left lateralized in typically developing children um, is well reorganized in the uh, single right hemisphere in C1. On the other hand, we find no differences in ventral white matter tracts, except for the left ansonid fasciculus. And th this might be associated with her low to average performance in sound to meaning tasks that are supposed to be facilitated by these tracts. So we see that tracts that are usually bilaterally organized in a neurotypical individual are not as well reorganized in a single hemisphere. And maybe the, these abilities to sound, uh, to map sound to meaning might depend more on cross hemispheric interactions. So to summarize the findings, we see initial delays in C1's behavior. So she starts very low, but she quickly catches up and she shows age appropriate language skills at school years. In fact, she shows exceptional performance in tasks that require mapping sound to articulation, such as phonology, word reading, and speech repetition. And this is accompanied by unusually large dorsal white matter tracts in her teenage years, which might um, actually facilitate this kind of performance. So to conclude, development of normal language abilities is possible without the left hemisphere, which is the, the dominant uh, hemisphere for language. And although we don't really understand the conditions that allow for such remarkable plasticity, we speculate that it's due to a unique combination of 
different factors. Uh, first of all, lesion timing, and we infer that by looking at the comparison between C1 and the children with large left lesions. So they had equally large uh, or quite extensive lesions, but the timing was different. And it could be the case that uh, the lesion for C1 happened at an optimal stage in neural development, uh, such that allowed her to show this uh, unique trajectory. We also think that there are genetic influences, and we can um, infer that by looking at her sibling, who performed extraordinarily well in uh, most of the tasks. So this probably indicates that uh, C1 has a lot of potential um, to begin with, and also environmental influences. Again, uh, looking at uh, the sibling, but also knowing that she comes from a very supportive family, and that she received intensive therapy from very early on. Um, and we think that uh, all of these factors or interaction between them has resulted in this unique uh, plasticity we see in C1. And with that, I would like to thank my collaborators at the University of California and Irvine, the University of Chicago, um, the NIH for funding, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a completely different kind of talk on what development can achieve for you. And you have, with your conclusion slide, you have already perfectly set the scene for the first of your audience questions, which are actually two questions. Firstly, how does C1's performance compare with other cases of her, with her condition, if they exist? Um, and whether you have had a chance to look at siblings of any of the L cases? Um, so, as I mentioned, there are other cases with hemifibronocephaly reported in the literature. However, they, um, they don't have such an in-depth neuropsychological assessment of their participants. It's usually neurologists or doctors who have come across these cases and reported them. Um, so I am not really uh, um, aware of such a detailed um, assessment in another participant with uh, hemihydronencephaly. But uh, uh, from what I recall from these nine cases in, in uh, the literature, about four of them developed normal language skills um, and about five out of them developed normal cognitive skills. Um, but there is no detail into where their strengths and weaknesses lie. Um, with respect to the second question, I'm afraid we don't uh, have siblings for those other uh, cases with large left lesions. That would be uh, great to, to, to investigate. Your talk is sparking a huge number of questions in the chat, but I'm afraid in the interest of giving everyone a chance to give their talk, um, I would like to invite the next speaker to get ready and would ask, like to ask you to try to answer the questions for your talk uh, via the chat function, please. Sure. Our next speaker is Arjun Sen, who is a consultant neurologist and BRC Senior Research Fellow and Fellow of the Oxford Martin School. Since 2012, he has been the head of the Oxford Epilepsy Research Group. And in his talk, he's going to bridge the gap from development to neurodegeneration through lessons from epileptogenic human cortex. Off you go, thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for that kind introduction, and, and thank you to the organisers for inviting me to speak at the important annual neuroscience symposium. I confess, having heard Simon and Salome's talks, you might find this a little bit basic in comparison, um, but we can see what we can do. And what we're going to talk about is how we're going to link neurodevelopment and neurodegeneration and epilepsy over the course of the next 18 minutes. In terms of the brief overview, this is what we're going to discuss. And we're going to try and blend all of these topics together and then come to a clinical trial that we've launched, launched in Oxford, the ILIAD trial, which I will explain at the end of the presentation. Now, this is a very important anniversary. Um, Thomas Willis wrote about epilepsy, um, but epilepsy is a condition that is as old as humanity. Um, it has been with us for a long time. Hippocrates wrote about it, for example. 
But when epilepsy really began to dawn in terms of neurology, perhaps happened at the National Hospital, which was called the National Hospital for the Paralyzed and the Epileptic. And this um, photograph is particularly important. There are many of the doyens of neurology at that time in this photograph, including Hewlings Jackson, Gowers, Ferrier, and Victor Horsley, who's widely accredited as performing the first epilepsy surgery. Based on Salome's talk, I just thought I'd quickly also mention Chris Adams, who was a neurosurgeon in Oxford for a long period of time, who actually pioneered the Adams hemispherectomy, um, a modification of previous hemispherectomies as a treatment for epilepsy. So why is everyone interested in epilepsy? Well, it's very common. 50 million people have epilepsy across the world, the majority of which live in resource poor settings. It's a condition that associates with significant risk and also associates with significant comorbidities. In the UK, 5% of us will have a seizure at some stage in our lifetime. That's around 603,000 people with epilepsy, active epilepsy at the moment, all socioeconomic groups, all ages, but higher in the elderly, which again ties in with neurodegeneration, which we'll come on to. And it also means that the prevalence of epilepsy will increase as demographics shift. Another reason it's important is it's a very treatable condition. You can see the exponential rise in anti-seizure medications that have come about, particularly since the mid 1990s. And around 70% of people with epilepsy will get good control of their seizures with appropriate medications at appropriate doses. So what is epilepsy? Well, now I hope everyone likes this slide. I try and get it into many presentations, um, partly because my daughters can't work out how I did it. Um, but with the passage of time, I now find that I can't work out how I did it either. But this is hopefully the networks that you're all utilizing at the moment, where things are flowing smoothly, information is being processed and remembered and then consolidated. And what happens in epilepsy is there's a disruption of those networks. And that disruption can either be focal, as is shown here, or it can be more widespread and generalized. Now, if you have a focal disruption of your nerve cell networks that are leading to epilepsy, then you could think about potentially removing that focus to try and actually cure the epilepsy rather than treating the seizures. So the commonest cause of drug resistant epilepsy in adults is a condition called hippocampal sclerosis. And you've seen um, very detailed high resolution MRI scans in the previous presentation. This deliberately is a very low resolution scan taken from the 1990s, which demonstrates quite clearly that there is a difference in the left hippocampus compared to the right. And you can remove hippocampal sclerosis. This is the resected temporal lobe and the hippocampus. And you find that in hippocampal sclerosis, you have nerve cell loss, particularly through the CA1 region, for example, as well as sometimes affecting CA3 and CA4. And this can be a highly effective treatment for drug resistant epilepsy, resulting in seizure freedom for up to 70% of individuals. Now, appreciate that we're doing this online um, rather than um, in a, an auditorium. So I thought it important to say that the next slide is quite graphic. So if you don't want to see the next slide, then do look away. And what we're showing here is epilepsy surgery in action. So this is the um, cortex exposed with the grid electrodes over the cortex and stimulating electrodes here, trying to determine um, whether an area may be appropriate for resection without resulting in long-term functional difficulties. If you did look away, you can look back now. So having resected hippocampal sclerosis, what can we do with the tissue? Well, there's a lot you can do because you now have access to human hippocampal tissue. So you can study it with immunohistochemistry and Western blot analysis. You can do patch clamp recordings from single cells um, and delineate neuroanatomy very well. This demonstrated from Professor Somaji's group. You can do um, slice recordings and then you can infuse various anti-seizure medications or other medications into the CSF to see if you can suppress induced seizure activity. 
And you can also back correlate the pathology and the electrophysiological findings to ultra high field um, MRI scans. This was work to see, for example, if seven Tesla imaging can better predict post-operative outcome or predict the post-operative pathology that you find. Hippocampal sclerosis, as mentioned, is a condition characterized by segmental neuronal loss. And the mechanisms of neuronal loss include apoptosis, excitotoxicity, and necrosis. And in older patients, you can also see tau hyperphosphorylation. So all of this together led us to think about, well, what molecules might be important, both contributing to neurodegeneration, but might be important in epilepsy, and might there also be a neurodevelopmental angle? And these are some examples, and what I spent my PhD looking at was a molecule called cyclin-dependent kinase 5, or CDK5. And I'm not expecting any of you to remember CDK5 off itself, it's just the principles that we're trying to communicate here. So CDK5 is a molecule that's important in neuronal migration, acts on guidance, and critical to the hexalaminar architecture that we see in cerebral cortex. If you delete CDK5, the, the animals are perinatally lethal, but you can delete the principal activator of CDK5, and that results in gross disruption of the cortex as illustrated in panel D here, with large pyramidal neurons placed very superficially. Perhaps unsurprisingly, P35 knockout mice are also more prone to seizures, and certainly if seizures are induced, then those seizures tend to be more severe. How can we then interrelate that to neurodegeneration? Well, it all depends on how CDK5 is activated. So CDK5 is sitting here, and normally it's activated by P35. Stresses, including excitotoxic stress, as you can see during seizures, or A-beta stresses can result in calpane-mediated cleavage of P35 to P25, that results in aberrant activation of CDK5, phosphorylation of the NMDA receptor, influx of calcium, and resultant cell death from those mechanisms that we mentioned just a moment ago. We then showed some time ago now that CDK5 is deregulated in human hippocampal sclerosis. It was further shown um, that there is hyperphosphorylation of tau in older patients who are undergoing surgical intervention for hippocampal sclerosis is illustrated here. And that's, that all suggests a sort of commonality of pathway. But to demonstrate causality, you'd want to inhibit CDK5 and see if you could actually prevent neuronal loss. So that's been demonstrated in animal models now. That was done in the Department of Pharmacology a few years ago. Um, just small numbers showing that if you inhibit CDK5 in a pilocarpine um, induced seizure model, you can prevent neuronal loss. So, okay, so that's hippocampal sclerosis. Let's think about alternative um, epileptogenic pathologies. Illustrated here is a condition called focal cortical dysplasia. Hopefully, you can see that there is blurring of the cortical architecture just here, just uh, in the, in the uh, left frontal cortex as you look at it. Um, there is also a transmantle sign for those of you who are very keen and very observant. So focal cortical dysplasia is a condition, it's a neuronal migration disorder, a neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, so uh, people have this condition uh, in utero. It's a very potent substrate for seizures. And we've been looking at focal cortical dysplasia for many years. This is a post-mortem sample of a patient who had undergone um, resection of their right temporal lobe for hippocampal sclerosis. However, they continued to experience seizures, and at post-mortem, they were found to have this area of cortical dysplasia, which is probably where the seizures were coming from. That hadn't been picked up on imaging at that time. When we stained the cortex for hyperphosphorylated tau, you can see the ribbon there that the abnormal cortex stains for tau, whereas adjacent cortex does not. Obviously, the adjacent cortex has been exposed to seizures, same medications and so on and so forth, as the neurodevelopmentally abnormal cortex. We can go on further and demonstrate, and we demonstrated in a series of older patients, 
that regions of cortical dysplasia in older adults associate with tau hyperphosphorylation and also with neuronal loss, but not in the regions of the adjacent normal regions. You can do silver staining to demonstrate that these are tau tangles, as illustrated here, and also confocal microscopy to demonstrate tau tangles in dysmorphic neurons. So how do we bring all of that together clinically? So we've now seen that there are neurodevelopmental pathologies that um, have hyperphosphorylation of tau limited to the area of uh, the pathology, and these are very potent substrates for seizures. But what happens if we look at it the other way around? Well, seizures are very common in Alzheimer's disease. One in nine people with Alzheimer's will have a seizure. And it's not an epiphenomenon. And there are some of the data that show it's not an epiphenomenon uh, listed on this slide, but progressively more and more data suggests that actually epilepsy and seizures may contribute to the pathogenesis of neuronal loss in Alzheimer's disease. In animal models, you can use one of those anti-seizure medications that we mentioned before, levetiracetam, um, to actually show that you reduce neuritic plaque formation in Alzheimer's disease transgenic mice. And then this paper, which now came out nearly 10 years ago, um, simultaneously changed my life both for the better and for the more difficult. So Leonard Mooker's group have done a lot of work on um, Alzheimer's disease and the potential impact of anti-seizure medications, particularly levetiracetam. And this was interesting because it seemed that levetiracetam could suppress neuronal network dysfunction and potentially reverse cognitive deficits in this transgenic model. And this was not seen with other anti-seizure medications. This was then trialed in mild cognitive impairment. Um, and it can be shown in mild cognitive impairment that there is um, excess activity, excess hypersynchronous activity in the hippocampus. Anti-seizure medications generally act as a break on hypersynchronous networks. And if you gave levetiracetam to people with mild cognitive impairment, you showed stabilization of the network in the hippocampus and also that they performed better on tasks of memory. So for example, they were more likely to remember what has been seen previously and less likely to fall for one of the foils, a similar lure, for example. So to take that further, we then initiated the Iliad study, which is the investigation of levetiracetam in Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's the first trial that is really looking at an anti-seizure medication in dementia to help treat cognition rather than to treat seizures. It has sometimes felt like Homer's Iliad in trying to get this trial to deliver. Um, we did open just prior to the COVID pandemic um, starting. Eight patients were recruited and eight, those eight patients have completed the trial all the way through. So there were no dropouts, but we're now hoping to reopen again and complete the recruitment. This is a double blind placebo control study comparing levetiracetam to placebo. You can see that patients cross over and there will be um, intra-individual analysis as well to see whether levetiracetam may be beneficial. So potentially, we can now use an anti-seizure medication to help stabilize nerve cell networks in dementia, in people who haven't had seizures but do have dementia, and see if that has a positive impact on cognition. So in conclusion, there's only a brief overview, but hopefully have illustrated that there are many commonalities between epilepsy and neurodegeneration, and also considerable overlap between epilepsy and neurodevelopment. We have the opportunity in epilepsy to study human surgically, surgically resected tissue and then dissect out pathways of neuronal development and neurodegeneration and hopefully then better understand cortical networks. And this may potentially lead to the repurposing of anti-seizure medications as a treatment for dementia. But as we all know, there's no heavier burden than great potential. I'll try and keep you posted on how we deliver on this. In the meantime, I'd like to thank all of the collaborators who are listed here and the, and the MRC for um, helping sponsor the Iliad trial and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Arjun, for a very different, but nonetheless very exciting talk to me. Uh, while we wait to see whether there are any questions coming through for you in the chat, I have one possibly slightly evil question that links 
your work on the um, P35 mutations to Simon's butt talk at the beginning of this symposium. And I'm wondering whether you or anyone else has looked at whether in the um, P35 knockout, somatostatin interneurons are overrepresented in the outer cortical layers which contain the early born big pyramidal neurons that should normally be sitting in cortical layers five and six. So that is a truly evil question for a clinician, and we might invite Simon to perhaps comment as well. Um, the, P, the P35 knockout has been around for quite a long time. So that paper was in 1997 that they looked at that, and they have there has been a wide they have looked at somatostatin and lots of other aspects, but I'm not in a position personally to comment on a specific answer to that question as to whether that's been looked at in that way. Um, I don't, I mean, maybe unfair to ask whether Simon wants to comment at this stage or not, but he's welcome to if he wishes. Simon has just confirmed what you said. It's a nasty question, but it would be interesting to know. <laughs> Apologies in that case for asking a nasty question. No problem at all. I haven't got any other questions for you in the chat at the moment, but I would like you to definitely hang around and monitor the chat so that if any more questions for you do pop up, you can answer them via the chat. And I would like to now move on and ask Lina to prepare. Lina Zhao is another Oxford Martin School um, fellow. She is working under the joint supervision of Professor Xin Lu at the Ludwig Institute and Professor Hagen Bailey in the Department of Chemistry. Her talk is entitled bioengineering iPSC-derived neural tissues with 3D patterns. These tissues are being developed for implantation and for the investigation of disease mechanisms. Okay, can you hear me? I hope you can. Yes, we can hear you, no problem. I can see you as well now. <laughs> I just uh, struck uh, one moment and struggling to find the video actually when um, okay. so your camera Here's, can you, yeah can you yep. see properly yep now we okay can the cool thank you anna for the introduction so today i'm also probably talking about something different uh, using bioengineering approach to build 3d neural tissues so this is uh, how we do the 3D printing. This is a video, uh, one of our printing process. Normally we use, um, uh, take the bio ink into the uh, printing nozzle. We build this by uh, printing by ourselves. And then, then the, uh, the printer can eject this droplets you can see in the video. And the point ejection, they can spontaneously form this uh, monolayer of lipid. And when we position, these uh, droplets together, they will form bilayer in between. And this adhesive bilayer force is the uh, key to um, keep the 3D uh, object uh, in content. Um, and this is the uh, just a gallery of all these um, different uh, 3D uh, printed um, structures in our lab. So the majority of our bioprinting projects are involved uh, with uh, neural printing because this is one of the most challenging uh, tissue. It's very soft and the cells are delicate. And uh, with our um, printer, we can generate droplets around 20 to about 200 micrometer in diameter. And we can control the roughly around how many cells in each droplet by adjusting the size of the droplet and also the cell density in the bio ink that we prepared. And this is a fraction of a printed network. And you can see this boundary or this uh, hexagonal structure is one droplet. And then you can see these little dots like structure. They are, uh, they are cells and this is a high cell density. Uh, uh, printing the network and with the fluorescent lipid we can label this bilayer um, between droplets. We differentiate iPSCs to neural progenitor cells 
and we harvest them in, and then suspend them in matrix gel. And we uh, to form this uh, by ink we are printing, we print them uh, into uh, 3D uh, uh, di uh, dimensional structures, and this is just a very small fraction on the microscope with calcine label after uh, this uh, printing process. Even just after one day, we can say process generates across these droplets, and they can form these uh, longer processes. They also migrate, as you can see, they, you can't see the droplets boundary after a while. And the viability we can get from our 3D printer is above 95%. We can grow this printed structure or keep them alive for over 100 days. So we can look at the longer term of differentiation, maturation, and the function of these tissues um, post printing. For example, we can say multiple neural rosettes in printed structures. You could say neural markers, which appear at a different time, say deep 2, uh, MAP2, and also mature neuron, uh, new, uh, neural N, and uh, uh, also astrocytes. We observed. Um, also spontaneous calcium uh, uh, fracturation in this uh, printed structure. And at the beginning, they are reasonable irregular. And after longer uh, time of differentiation, they form more regular and uh, uh, corrected um, uh, oscillation. We can also pattern these uh, neuron tissues in the construct and, and then study, for example, cell migration of neurons from one compartment to another compartment, and we can quantify these processes. And with, uh, collabor in a collaboration with uh, Francis and the Jordan, we try, we're currently trying to build these layered cortic tissues, which uh, we uh, intend to say, uh, uh, plantation potential of these uh, printed structures. And that's all from me, and these are the people I'm working with. Thank you. Thank you very much for that blitz through 3D <laughs> printing of neurons. At the moment, there are no questions for you in the chat yet. Um, so I have only one question for you while Mauta, our next speaker, gets ready. Sure. And that's a very basic probably more engineering like question how long do your cells or neurons actually stay alive in your bio ink in the printing process so is there a time limit to how much time you can take to print your 3d structure yes since uh, you know matrix gel uh, we have to keep them between four to about eight degree so it's a reasonable cold for the cells so we have a window of three hours we can print yeah, we print about one second per job place. So let's give us, you know, some time, about three hours to print about 10 structures, about one millimeter in three dimension. Okay, that's not unreasonable. I, I think <laughs> that you might have a much shorter time frame to be able to do this. <laughs> yeah. um, you're starting to get questions in the chat function. Um, I would like you to try and answer those in the chat function if possible so that we can get on and give Maita a chance to also give his presentation. Okay, that's thank okay. you. Um, our next speaker is Maita Kaller, who is a postdoctoral researcher in the Wellcome Trust Center for Integrative Neuroimaging. He completed his DPhil in Oxford two years ago, and his research interests focus on myelination and brain plasticity. Go ahead, Mauta. Thank you very much for the invitation to talk. Um, I want to tell you a quick story about our oligodendrocytes, um, a highly complex cell in the nervous system, central nervous system, famous for forming all the myelin and uh, essential for brain function. And these cells differentiate from a cell population called oligodendrocyte precursor cells. Um, and if we look at development here, an example is the mouse in a mouse cortex, most of the myelination happens in early development. However, it continues even into older adulthood. And interestingly here is that the oligodendrocyte precursor cells do not disappear, but form a resident progenitor cell population, the largest progenitor cell population in our brain, um, and continue to differ differentiate into oligodendrocytes. And what we have learned recently is that indeed experience and neural activity can influence the proliferation as well as the differentiation of these progenitor cells. 
um, in our in our brain. And that means to summarize it, that means that the formation of oligodendrocytes is continuous during adulthood and is dynamic and plastic. And one big question uh, is why? Because we really don't understand the function of this process at the moment. And one approach to tackle that question is to use a transgenic mouse model that allows the conditional and specific uh, deletion of the differentiation potential of this oligodendrocyte precursor cells without affecting existing oligodendrocytes or the precursor cells itself. And using this model, we could indeed replicate influential studies in the field that suggest um, a learning and performance deficit on a behavior task called the complex wheel task, which would, would suggest that the differentiation of these new cells is involved in learning. However, further characterizing the cells, we find that there's also an altered brain microstructure in these animals a few weeks after blocking the differentiation. And this changes, we can also see in animals that have not even been exposed to a learning task. So that has, seems to happen by default over time. Additionally, we also find changes in electrophysiology in these animals using in vivo EEG recording, uh, finding evidence for a, a increase in spectral power density in these animals across the lower frequency bands. And that is even before the behavior, uh, which indicates that we might simply have a different condition in which these two animals approach the behavior task. To conclude here is that the um, knocking out the differentiation of oligodendrocytes in adulthood indeed leads to kind of a subtle and complex phenotype that, but that we can't really distinguish between, you know, the effect of an adaptive plastic process, which might be involved in actively learning, or if we simply disrupt in a homeostatic process that happens over time and might change brain function. So the take home message I wanna give, I guess, is that oligodendrocyte, oligodendrocyte formation remains dynamic and adaptive in adulthood. And that happens for a reason, but that we don't really understand the function of this process yet. And we need better models to really tackle it. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Maita, for this breeze through myelination in the adult brain. Um, while we're waiting to see whether there are any questions for you coming up in the chat, I only have one clarifying or clarification question. The structural changes and the um, EEG changes only occur after you've actually generated the conditional knockout, or could there be something strange in your genetic background that precipitates these changes earlier? Uh, no, they only happen after. To be, to be fair, we have not directly uh, compared animals that haven't received tamoxifen, but our control condition also has, uh, you know, the flux knockout and the same genetic background. Um, so I would be very surprised if these changes would be due to the background. Okay, fair enough. Um, while we wait to see whether there are any more questions coming up for you, um, Filippo, could you start to get ready for your presentation, please? Right, Maite, if you could continue monitoring the chat to see whether there are any other interesting questions coming up for you and then answer them via the chat function. Sure, thank will, you. Thank you. I will introduce our next speaker and last speaker of the quick symposium talks. Filippo Getzi is a final year graduate student already introduced by Simon Butt, who is one of his supervisors. His other two are Michael Kohl and Louise Upton. Filippo completed his undergraduate degree in neuroscience at the University of Parma in Italy, followed by a master's in neuroscience in Trieste. And he will present to us uh, the function of GABAergic networks in developing mouse visual cortex. Off you go, Filippo. Thank you very much, Anna, for the introduction. And thanks, Simon, for setting the stage for my presentation. And I will quickly recap what uh, he discussed uh, during his presentation. So he, Simon described how uh, transient networks are uh, important during the early personal development uh, in the mouse somatosensory cortex. And in particular, uh, he discussed of uh, a transient network between somatostatin interneurons in layer five that are uh, regulating the development of layer four excitatory neurons uh, uh, that are the main thermal recipient uh, cells in the somatosensory cortex. And through in vivo experiments, uh, we also uh, showed how 
they have five somatostatin interneurons are already engaged by whisker stimulation, and hence they are uh, regulating the flow of information in the somatosensory cortex. And uh, the main, uh, the aim of my PST project uh, was then to look at uh, visual cortex, uh, to test the hypothesis uh, that the same network might be important uh, for development of primary sensory areas in general. So I repeated the same experiments uh, done in the past uh, by performing laser scanning photostimulation and glutamate and caging experiments during touch clamp recordings. And on the left, you can see the uh, average map data uh, of layer two, three and layer four excitatory neurons. And if you focus on layer four, in B on the bottom, you can see how uh, the input from layer five, from deep layer five, uh, are never present. And the same uh, happens also for layer two, three excitatory neurons. And this is demonstrating how uh, there are different networks established between the two primary sensory cortices. Uh, we also looked at uh, excitatory neurons in the deep layers of the cortex. And in CNB, you can see uh, layer five and layer six excitatory neurons respectively. And uh, interestingly, these two uh, class of uh, excitatory neurons receive uh, transient GABAergic connectivity from the uh, superficial layers, so from layer two, three and from layer four, uh, only during the very first uh, window of, of development that we investigated, uh, uh, roughly corresponding to the first postnatal week. Uh, and this project is actually uh, still underway to investigate what is the functional role of these uh, transient networks from supergalonal layers. But bottom line, the networks between V1 and S1 uh, seems very different. And I then moved uh, to study the function of these GABAergic interneurons uh, in developing visual cortex uh, with in vivo electrophysiological recordings. And, and you can see on, on the left how uh, a mouse already responds and the primary visual cortex of the mouse uh, is responsive to a uh, flash of white light even before eye opening that occurs around P14, postnatal day 14. And uh, I then exploited channel adopting and optogenetics to uh, uh, interneurons in the in vivo cortex. So we, we either the somatostatin Cree line to specifically target somatostatin interneurons or the NKX21 Cree line uh, to target both uh, parabumin and somatostatin interneurons. And after tagging, I can uh, see how these interneurons respond during uh, visual stimuli. And as you can see in BNC, uh, a proportion of these interneurons tagged are responsive. Uh, to the visual stimulus, and uh, they mainly focus uh, uh, in uh, within layer four or in this uh, more superficial portion of layer five, uh, still uh, in line with the uh, mapping in vitro data. So, in conclusion, uh, these two projects uh, that I described and then Simon described in the previous talk uh, showed how uh, distinct abergic networks are established between the primary somatosensory and visual cortex. And these two networks might still support similar functions uh, to the developing neocortex in maturing, in leading to the maturation of the, the final network. And thank you all for the attention and my collaborators on this project. Thank you very much, Filippo, for what to me anyway is an extremely exciting talk again. <laughs> um, while we wait to see whether there are any questions for you in the chat function, What's your gut feeling? Has every part of the neocortex developed its own solution to these early networks? Or do we have two canonical systems, the way it works in the visual cortex and the way it works in the somatosensory cortex, and every other part of the cortex chooses one of these two options? It's a very interesting question. And it's, it's, it's something that you know, we keep discussing in the lab. And uh, we, we would like to test it uh, properly by investigating different areas. Uh, something that it's, it's important to note is that in the mouse, the somatosensory cortex is extremely, extremely specialized uh, for a given function. So you have, you know, uh, the, the input from a single whisker uh, collapsing into a, a single column uh, of, of the cortex uh, in the barrel cortex. Uh, and while the visual cortex in the mouse is supposed to be less organized, it's described as the salt and pepper uh, kind of uh, cortex organization. So it's it would be interesting to test these hypotheses looking in other primary sensory cortices, uh, like the auditory cortex, or even looking uh, outside primary sensory cortices as well. 
whoops, thank you very much for that answer. Um, I hope you get the funding and the opportunity to look at Hopefully. the other parts of the <laughs> cortex. Um, no other questions have come through in the chat yet. We are now entering a short break period before the final session of the afternoon. It would be great if all of the speakers could stay around to answer further questions that might come in the chat. And I would just really like to thank all of our speakers from this afternoon's sessions for great talks. And I think in particular, the three short talk presenters deserve an extra round of praise for managing to stick to time and deliver these short talks under difficult circumstances. Thank you very much.